Welcome to LaGrange First Church of God. You are now listening to our weekly podcast. Thanks for tuning in. For everybody in this room, when you hear the word priesthood, you may have a lot of different thoughts, a lot of different connotations. But without a doubt, as much as we like being called redeemed children of God, the righteousness of God, you know, and all these uh, more than a conqueror, uh, an ambassador, all these things that we take on this new identity in Christ, all these things that we were made once God, Jesus Christ saved us from our sins. One of the identities we took on is being a priesthood of the saints. So I want to talk about that. But to start off with, I kind of want to back up. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I was in Texas this last week. And I'm part of a learning cohort uh, over the next couple months, and there's like uh, nine other pastors and myself, and they're from Portland, Washington, Illinois, everywhere. They're just from everywhere, okay? And uh, it it comforted me to know when we all got together in Houston, Texas uh, last week that all of us are messed up people. (laughs) We don't know what we're doing. So uh, that made me feel good. But I have never actually been to Houston other than to change flights before. Did you guys know Houston is like the fourth biggest city in... Yeah, okay, some of you did that. I did not know that, okay? Uh, it is. It is huge. And did any of you know it was like really close to the Gulf? I, I did not know that either. And so it was very hot and it was raining all the time. And people were like, how was Texas? And I'm like, it was miserable. They're like, well, it was 16 here. I'm like, and it rained the whole way. But maybe give you some more context to that, okay? To try to save you all money, I'm like, Sheena, put me at a hotel where I don't have to get an Uber or rent a car and so I can walk to the place where we meet, which was about three four blocks, about two and a half, three blocks over. So I was like, I'll work every day. Well, the problem is, is it didn't rain every day. It monsooned every day. Okay. Like I'm talking like if we built an ark, we probably would have been okay. And I thought with my trusty little, you know, that little fold up umbrella you carry with you in life. I was like, this will be my Noah's staff the whole way. And I woke up the net, you know, the first morning and I walked after I got in the night before I walked over and I shielded myself and I got in, I had rain all over my face. And uh, I hoped that the rain would deflect my profuse sweating. Okay. I was like, I don't want people to know that I don't know very well that I'm a profuse sweater. Those of you who are visiting, I sweat a lot. Okay. So I walked in and blamed it on the rain, even though I was just sweating all the time. <laughs> Well, when you get into these types of groups, you get into like these these general ideas and they break it down to practical ideas and then you all whine about your problems, okay? And this is like a 10, 12 hour day. Well, after this whole long day of all of these things that are going on, okay, they decide, you know, we got to take everybody out to dinner. The problem is, is that this monsoon fully hit, okay? It's raining hard, 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 hard. And we're just getting bound like about two, three blocks to this Mexican restaurant, which has been like two blocks straight over from my restaurant or from my hotel. So we get down there and we kind of fight the rain with my little, you know, umbrella. And I kind of get down there and I make it in and everybody's there. And they're like, why did you not take a cab? I'm like, I'm cool, man. I got my umbrella, you know? And uh, so then as it's going, have you ever heard the rain rain? And then you heard it just like, you know what I mean? Like machine guns on the roof type deal. Well, it continued to do that. And most of us know in our lives when, you know, the machine gun comes down, you're like, it'll stop. Right? It'll stop. The problem is it don't in Texas. Everything's bigger in Texas. Even the rain is bigger in Texas. Now, if I've been with you for 10 or 12 hours talking about job stuff, functional stuff, personal stuff, and I don't know you, I don't want to talk to you anymore about Mexican food. And it had gotten so bad, everybody's calling their Uber. I'm like, I don't need an Uber. I got my, 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 my trusty umbrella. And I'm like, guys, I just got to go. They're like, you know, just share. Just wait. A lift will come. I'm like, no, 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 no. I'll, I'll make it. They're like, Ben, you really should. I'm like, no, I can make it. And so I got out and I got my umbrella. And have you ever just like immediately took a step into any scenario in life? Maybe it's a relationship. Maybe it's a job. Or maybe it's the Texas rain. And you thought, I have just made a bad idea. <laughs> so much so that there's no going back. Because I'm too prideful to go backwards. And so the guy who was doing the valet car, he said, you know, he was Hispanic. He's like, senor, he said, no, no, no. And I'm like, no, oh, I got this because I got an umbrella, you know, <laughs> and like people, cars are flying in and out. And by the way, we're on a major highway. We're kind of like downtown Houston. And there is like an eight or eight, well, no, four lane. Uh, and then you've got the, uh, what do you call it? A, uh, 
Medium, yeah, like a boulevard, like a medium thing. And so I get out, and what I thought would be puddles, as soon as I stepped in the water with my one pair of shoes, the puddles were pools. And I'm not kidding. And I was like, oh, oh no, I only have one pair of shoes. And now I'm trying to go, uh oh, because the rain's like swirling and twirling. And I'm like, okay. And I'm not making this up to be funny. I'm like, how's this going to happen? So then I wait for my hole and I sprint to the median. And I'm just like, yeah, I'm there. And I'm already soaked. Now, I'm just trying to dodge traffic. And as I see the next one, I can see the curb, I can see the sidewalk I'm trying to get to. And I look at it. And I see it, and I'm gauging traffic, and I'm like, I can do this. And I look, and I look, and I look, and I kid you not, I probably, it was probably for me to the end of that chair line. And I kind of took off, and probably about right here, I realized this isn't a pool, this is like a bayou. And I jumped. And I don't know, because if I had an umbrella, I thought Mary Poppins would kick in. (laughs) But I just tried the best Michael Jordan I could, hit. And I've got this massive, massive black swelled up spot on my inside of my foot. Hit it, fell, fell onto my right shoulder into a, another pool puddle. And I would like to say that my wet pants were the worst, that my wet shoes were the worst, that my surgery shoulder was the worst. But my pride beyond all things, as all these cars are just driving by, was by far the most damaged. And I say that to you because all of you are like, Ben, how dumb are you? How many surgeries must it take for this moron to understand he can't do these things anymore? You were thinking of that. <laughs> And then I started thinking about how arrogantly we believe the best in ourselves in so many things, don't we? Yeah? Like, I arrogantly believe I have this amazing health that can make me do Michael Jordan jumping, you know what I mean? Like, uh, I look on Facebook sometimes, and some of you really believe you understand supply-side economics and the whole foundational idealism of con- you know, conservatism. conservatism. <laughs> and we watch people get in political arguments back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, and then fun- inevitably it always comes to this. Somebody posts something, it's like, this wasn't even a real thing. But for whatever reason, when it comes to like uh, something political, we, we feel like we can jump in with all the confidence in the world. Or what if you, uh, uh, oh man, huh. I got, I don't get headaches like but once a year. Uh, I got a headache on the airplane coming home, okay? Now, if I'd had this headache at my house, what's the first thing I would have done? Got on WebMD. And then I would have discovered I had leukemia. <laughs> And then I would have called Dr. Sharp, and I would have said, Dr. Sharp, I'm dying. And she would have said, Ben, you're dumb. You know what I mean? Like, stop doing that. But we do these things with such confidence. Or we hear, like, you know, you know, some type of pop culture wisdom, and we believe that all millennials are just the worst things that ever happened in this world, even though we don't know a millennial. And we're like, because I heard it, therefore it must be. And we speak with such confidence about such things that seem so foolish, sometimes to me, it blows my mind that those things that we know nothing about will claim as absolute truth. But when the Word of God tells us we are a royal priesthood, we go, oh, not not me. That ain't me. That's for Pastor Ben. That's for the person who teaches Bible study. Have you ever done that before? You're like, no, that part does not apply to me. I've done that. I struggle with that when I read it. Sometimes I read it smart. I've, I can read it in Greek. I can read it in Hebrew. I can put it in context, historical, and all these things. And at the end of the day, I can't get away from what God's word is saying. And I'm just like, no, surely that doesn't apply to me, God. But by God, I believe I can jump over a pool. <laughs> Nonsense. What if we actually practiced the things we knew were true and stopped trying to practice the things that aren't? How different would our lives be then? How different would our lives be then? You know, I think that for us to understand I, I, what I believe is the reason most of us don't talk about the priesthood of saints is because of what we hear about in the Old Testament as we've been following through the Old Testament. So let's just look really quick at, you know, the general idea. There are lots of passages about 
priests in the Old Testament, okay? Particularly in the desert. I'm just going to use this condensed verse, okay? A couple thoughts that stand out. One, okay, Aaron, okay, is a descendant of Levi. He and Moses and Miriam are descendants of Levi. Levi is a tribe. They're a team. They're a family. And their job, their portion, their responsibility was to be a team of priests. That's what their job was to do, okay? It says, bring your fellow Levites from your ancestral tribe to join you when you assist, when you and your sons minister before the tent of the covenant of the law. Their job was to be a team that made the tabernacle like we talked about last week. And when they go on and build the temple, their job, their family job, their clan, that's what they did. They did temple stuff. That's what they did, okay? Now, the bigger thing I want you all to be aware of is if you look down kind of in the middle, it says, you are to be responsible for the care of the sanctuary and the altar so that my wrath will not fall on the Israelites. So it's not just their job to keep up with the tabernacle or the sanctuary. It's not just their job to do the work of the tabernacle or the temple, okay? Because not all of them got to be priests. Some of them just did, you know, Bible reading. Some of them just did uh, singing. Some of them just cleaned up around the outside. But they all had a shared responsibility in this part of worship. And their job, above all things, was to make sure that Israel was a holy nation. And when they're holy, when they were righteous with God, that means they are not at wrath with God. Now, a lot of times people, you know, you don't hear people talk about the wrath of God very often anymore. But the reality is, is it talks about it in the New Testament and it talks about it in the Old Testament. The wrath of God is not something to be feared. And it was their responsibility to keep the Israelites, the Jewish nation, the people of God, God's chosen people. Their responsibility was to make sure that they were right or righteous or holy with God. And that was done by sacrifices, that was done through a uh, day of atonement, ceremonies, things of that nature. And that's what these folks did. Their job was to keep the rest of the Israelites right with God as they became a nation. The problem is, is that this team ultimately failed. Now, I want to walk you through their failures and see if you can connect today with the church and its failure and its ability to recognize their identity of the priesthood of saints, okay? So I'm going to speed up all the way to the prophet Jeremiah. Now, what has happened in between this time and now is Israelite, the Israelites have gotten into the nation of Israel. It's become a nation. Eventually, they become a nation, and they decide one day, they're like, God, we don't want you as our king anymore. Give us a king. And so they give him Samuel, and, or not Samuel, they give him Saul, and that was just a, a mess up. And the whole idea was a jacked up idea from the beginning. It was doomed to start because that's not what God ever wanted to begin with, okay? And so finally, after all these kings, after the split, after all these things, and it gets gets to the very end, God calls the prophet Jeremiah, who's just a young kid, to get up, and he's going to go be a prophet to nations because Israel is going to meet its ultimate demise. But he's going to start with his home people in the land of Israel. And do you want to know who the people he was fighting with the most as he was trying to preach his message of repentance? Do you want to know the people that he fought with, the people who got in his way, the people who continued to make everything obstinate to him were, it was the priests. So I want you to see this. Just, let's just look at the first couple chapters, okay? Jeremiah chapter 5, they, the priests, have lied about the Lord. They said, he will do nothing. No harm will come to us. We will never see sword or famine, okay? This is the ultimate non-offensive gospel. Some churches you go to, you'll never hear the word sin because they don't want to offend uh, seeking people who are coming in, okay? We choose to be a church that says sin is sin, and your sin is going to send you to hell. Okay? We need forgiveness through Jesus Christ to obtain eternal life. That's who we are. If that sounds judgmental, it's not me. It's the Bible. Take it up with God. Okay? But these people have somehow finagled it. And we see that type of stuff in some, not all, okay, some congregations throughout today. We see it on some TV today. Not all TV preachers, there are some I think are fantastic, but some, they really are like, no, God's not mad. He loves you. He loves you. You can over-abuse the word love to the point where it sends people to hell. 
And that's why Jeremiah is called on the scene. Because the priests are giving him bad information. The priests are going there saying, God's not going to do anything to us. No harm's going to come on us. We're not going to see the sword. We're not going to see the phantom. Everything's going to be awesome. If you ever find yourself in a congregation where you don't feel some type of conviction, some type of push to draw you closer to God, I would say run. I would say run. And it's not because we're trying to be Bible thumpers. It's not trying to be you know, c- condemning of people. That, that is the last thing we want. We're supposed to speak the truth in love. But sometimes love is telling you you're doing the wrong thing. What if we raised our kids and never told them they were doing anything wrong? Corbin, way to break the window. <laughs> Fist bump. Reagan, I'm so glad you tore all the toilet paper all throughout the house. Thank you. You have a career in decorating. <laughs> what, what if we said that? But religion's good at that, right? And then it says in the next chapter, it says, They, the priests, they dress the wound of my people as though it were not serious. So they dress their sin. They tell them about their sin as if their sin is not serious. And they say this. They say, peace, peace, they say, when there is no peace. They go around and they say, your sin isn't bad. You're just so snug. (laughs) Let's have a love fest. Let's have a love fest. No, oh, don't offend them. Don't offend them. You're not offending people to hell. You know, that's <laughs> what's happening here. Okay? And the idea of peace is what? The opposite of peace is what? Wrath. Wrath. We need to remember our sin puts us at wrath with God. Why do we think we call Jesus the Prince of Peace? Because he came and brought us peace. Or a fancy theological term is he was the propitiation for our sins. It means he took on our sins so the wrath of God may be satisfied in Christ Jesus. But see, these people don't have that. And the priests are running around, and all of a sudden they're like, stop listening to Jeremiah. Stop listening to that man. He keeps telling you bad. I keep telling you peace, 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 guys, peace. It's all good. Next chapter. Do not trust their deceptive words and say, this is the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. He's saying, don't trust in stupid common sayings you hear every day. Christians are really good at making up their old vernacular, are we not? I was listening to somebody the other day who I love, care about, and their heart was pouring out, and they looked me in the eye, and I'm not running them down, just telling you the truth. They looked me in the eye, And they said, I know the Bible says God will never give you more than you can handle. And I just breathe, because I don't want to be pious. And I said, it doesn't say that. And I read him a passage that has been loosely interpreted from that. I would say God gave Job more than he could handle. You know, as a matter of fact, it's when God gives us more than we can handle is when he steps in and shows his greatest work. Amen? Amen. But we rob God of doing his greatest work when we start lying about who our God is and saying God wouldn't allow this to happen. And yet they're saying, oh, but we've got these you know, happy sayings. We've got these potholder verses. We, we take all these verses out of, you know, out of context. And da 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 We put it on potholders and carpets and pictures and t-shirts. And all that works for you because it makes us feel good because at our core in our sin, we're consumers. And Israel's falling into this. And you know what? i got to be honest with you. It's much easier for me to get up here and be funny than it is for me to get up here and tell you the truth. Because by the end of the day, someone isn't going to like me. I just pray and hope that you can channel that towards God. And then finally, Jeremiah has to continue to give the same message over and over. Don't you, doesn't it drive you nuts when you hear me or another pastor give like the same sermon? You're like, I heard that last year. I heard that. At Howe Military, we had to go to chapel every single day, every Sunday. And every single Sunday of the year was the same sermons over and over and over. And you know what? This is literally what Jeremiah is doing. He's coming again. He's saying, they dress the wounds of the people as though it were not serious. Peace, 
peace, they say, when there is no peace. He's saying this religion has been completely misleading you from the beginning. They keep telling you it's all good. They keep telling you to not focus on the sin. They want to be liked by you. Because at the end of the day, we all want to be liked. But what's more important is we want people to be known by Jesus Christ. Amen? And if we want to be liked more than we want people right with God, then we have a problem. And you know what? This message made Jeremiah extraordinarily unpopular. So much so, they threw him in a sewer, basically. Common day. They threw him in a cistern. It's like they threw him in a sewer. They're like, we don't want to hear any more of that because that doesn't make us feel good. That doesn't make us feel good. And so, inevitably, after they continue not to listen, not to listen, and they continue to allow these priests to mislead the people, to keep Israel from becoming the holy, righteous nation they were called to be. This is what God says. And then the Lord said to me, do not pray for the well-being of these people. Although they fast, I will not listen to their cry. Though they offer burnt offerings and grain offerings, I won't accept them. Instead, I'll destroy them with sword, famine, and plague. But I said, alas, sovereign Lord, the prophets kept telling them, you will not see the sword suffer famine. Indeed, I will give you lasting peace in this place. And so Jeremiah's in this battle. God comes to Jeremiah. He's like, stop praying from him. Stop praying for him right now. Could you imagine if I woke up this morning? I was like, hey, Tina, guess what? God told me to stop praying for you. How would you feel? You probably want me fired. Right? You're like, what kind of loving pastor does that? Right? And yet that's exactly what he says. He says, don't pray for them. Don't listen. When they pass the offering, I don't care if they give a million dollars in the plate. I find their worship to be detestable. I'm going to bring the sword and I'm going to bring famine. And even though their priests, their prophets tell them that I'm not going to do that, guess what? I'm God and it's happening. And it's happening. And it does. Imagine that. God can be trusted at his word. Amen. That's what happens. So far you're like, this is not fun, Ben. I know. But this is our God. And sin is serious. And he expects holiness from us. Are you starting to get now why when we don't take the priesthood of saints so seriously, why you see such ineptitude in churches across America? God has a huge responsibility and a high, high expectation. However, being a merciful guy, everybody say merciful. Merciful, Merciful. one more time. Merciful. Okay, after he sends them away, he destroys the temple, he sends them off into exile for the next 70 years, God speaks through Jeremiah and he says, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand and led them through Egypt because they broke my covenant. Though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord, this is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time, decrees the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and I will write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be their, my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, no God, because they will all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord, for I will forgive them of their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. So God comes to them and he, Jeremiah, God comes to Jeremiah and he speaks one more time. He says, look, even though they didn't listen, even though the priests are deplorable, now that my people are in exile, they don't have the land, they don't have the gift, they don't have everything I gave them before, I'm going to make a new promise. Even though they rejected my old promise, I'm going to make a new promise because God is merciful. One more time, say merciful. Merciful, because we're going to end on that. It's real important, okay? So what happens is God comes in the form of the flesh, Jesus Christ, and he lives a perfect, sinless life, dies on the cross, three days, buried and resurrected, and then we are told later on that if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is our Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we shall be saved. 
And so God comes, dies on the cross, raises from the grad. We put our faith in him so we can be redeemed children of God, so we can have that new identity, so we can walk around and strut, I am a child of God, and sing it all loud and happy. And we can walk around and we can say, yes, God loves me so much that he gave his only son. Yes, I am an ambassador of Christ. Yes, I'm the righteousness of Christ. Yes, I'm more than a conqueror. All these things the Bible says, I am, and I claim them in the name of Jesus. Praise the Lord. Then why aren't we talking more about the priesthood of the saints? Because that's also what he calls us to. And so now, with that set up for just a few minutes, I want you to stop, look with me, and open up if you're not there, or in 1 Peter chapter 2, just two verses, 9 and 10, on what the priesthood of saints is, what God expects from us. What is this thing that we now are all priests? It's not just for a little team. We are all on the same team if we are redeemed children of God. We are part of the priesthood of saints. Now, this is the Apostle Peter writing to uh, what we'd call like a diaspora, uh, a group of uh, believing Jewish people who are scattered out throughout the land, because imagine that. They put their faith in Jesus Christ and life got hard. But remember, life gets hard so God can step in. Amen? Amen. All right. So, it says, as he's talking about this, he's stopping and reminding them of their heritage, but he uses very specific terms that we cannot run away from, that we must remember. It says, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. All right, let's just stop and just look at a few things here. First, a chosen people. All right, now, a lot of times I can't say the word chosen because we're Wesleyan Church. You're like, that's only for the Presbyterians, Ben. We don't read that part. It's all the Word of God. Amen? And I'm not going to sit around here and do theological jumps and hoops for everybody here today, but if you are a redeemed child of God, you are a chosen child of God. Now, do you remember the first time you maybe dated your spouse, or maybe not, not dated, the first time you met your significant other, the first time you met uh, your, your future spouse, and they actually knew your name? Do you remember that? Did you remember how special you felt? Do you remember the first time your child called you dad? Or mom? Do you remember the first time, I don't know, when you went to school and you were all nervous and somebody actually called you by name and asked you to be a part of something with them? There's a lot sometimes when we use people's names and when we're identified that makes us feel good, doesn't it? Maybe I'll never remember. If you knew my name, I was like, wow, she's hot. She knows my name. I felt good. You know what I mean? So I'm at this thing, like I was talking about, in, in Texas. And the second day, they bring in a pretty well-known guy, okay? Uh, he's written a lot of books. I mean, like mega, 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 like 20,000 people church. But he also writes like business books and stuff. And we got to spend the whole day with him, okay? Like we just got to spend 12 hours with this cat. And it was like no holds barred. And he talked about stuff that only people probably like myself and people who do my job would really get. It was kind of nerd out time and, and all this Greek and all this stuff. But it made sense. And then it got heavier and then it got into our own, you know, personal stuff. Well, anyway, so he's getting on kind of a really touchy t topic. OK, and if I even said the topic, you'd be like, wow, you guys really are nerds. OK, like so I'm not even going to go there. But he could see that some people this point wasn't reg registering with. It was just like, it wasn't hitting. Now, it hit me, and so I'm just like, mm-hmm, I got gotcha. you. Yep, 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 yep. And so all of a sudden, he's like, hey, Ben, would you come up here for a minute? I'm like, oh. <laughs> he knows my name. <laughs> and I could almost feel like an aura coming off of you, like success. Not really. <laughs> Just that one moment, I felt so good that Larry Osborne knew Ben Stuckey. And I'm thinking about it, it like made my day. And as I'm going home with my little umbrella, right? 
I kid you not, the second block where I almost turned, all of a sudden it hit me. I, it just like, like God himself, boom. Why don't you care when I acknowledge you? Yeah, amen. Amen. I care more about what a man who will die and become worm food thinks and am more moved at my very soul when he calls my name than the thought that the Word of God says, I have called you by name. You are mine. God's Word says that, but I'm more moved when Larry Osborne says that. How does that happen? It becomes a heart issue. It becomes a priority issue. It's so easy for us to get things out of priority in our life, isn't it? And all of a sudden we're chasing after all these different people, all these different things, and all this different approval, all the time forgetting that all worth, all approval, all things, all good, all right, all truth comes from what our Maker says. But when we start to place priority on other people, places, and things, what those places, things, and people identify us as means more to us than what our Maker says. I mean, I literally just quoted you a passage from the Bible. I have called you by name. You are mine. But man, if I said, Michael Watts, how on up? All of a sudden something happens in your heart, right? You're like, whoa. No, it's not because he thinks I'm awesome. It's just because I was loud. But I think you know the point I'm getting at. Who are we chasing after? That's part of the reason we forget our role as the priesthood of believers is because we are chasing after other titles. I want Larry Osborne to think I'm a good pastor. I want person in the community to think I'm an awesome person. I want my wife to think I'm a good husband. I want my kids to think I'm a great father. I want all of you to like me. It's because that's who we are. But at the end of the day, all accolades from all people will be washed away. And the only thing we'll answer for at the reckoning day will be when God looks at us and he goes, Linda, is your name in the scroll of life? One, that would be terrifying if she didn't know what page, if he didn't know what page to turn to, right? Linda Taylor. Well, Taylor's a common name. Hold on. Hmm. I don't know. I mean, can you imagine your heart palpitation? Yeah, Dwayne, you feel that, right? You'd be like, all that work on the building, that don't mean nothing. It don't, we appreciate it, dude. But it don't mean nothing. It means nothing. The only thing that matters is the identity our maker gives us. And yet we chase and we chase and we chase. And I bet you, if you stopped and were honest with yourself for one minute, most of your frustrations in life are because you are not living up to the identity of somebody else when God already gave you the identity to succeed. You were a chosen person. God picked you. You were his. So now, let's get into a royal priesthood, okay? A royal priesthood. Now, why is this a royal priesthood? Well, the first thing we have to remember, and I didn't have time to put all this scripture together because it would just be too confusing, okay? But out of the priests that were selected to work in the temple, there was one priest above all, and he was called the high priest, okay? And the high priest was the person who was called to go into the holiest of holies one day a year to present a sin offering so all the people could be forgiven of their sins. The problem with the high priest was this. He sinned too. And so before he ever went in to offer a sin offering for everybody else's sins to be forgiven, he had to offer sin offering for himself to get the sin offering off himself to make sure he was holy enough to have an unholy thought, an unholy way, an unholy thing, and then sneak in, drop the blood, and run away before he was unholy again. So everybody could have forgiveness of sins one time a year. But we have a great high priest who God chose in himself in the form of Jesus Christ. And he came, and he didn't just come with lamb's blood, goat's blood, turd's blood, whatever blood. He came with the blood of God, the Lamb of God. He died on the cross for our sins. And that blood is what redeems all of us from all of our sins. Now, he is the great high priest. Now, he is also the king of kings. 
So he is the king priest, is what he is. Now, for us to understand this, I want you to go back to the passage Sarah read, okay? Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to what? Empathize. Not sympathize, but to what? Empathize with our weaknesses. But we have one who has been tempted in every way. Say tempted tempted in every way, just as we are. Yet he did not sin. Everybody say, yet, yet. yet. He, did not sin. he did not sin. You want to know where I think people fail? People don't fail. Christians don't fall when they sin. They fell before that. They fall before that moment. You know when we fail, when we fall, is when we don't fight. I don't know about you, but let's stop with this part one. I would rather deal with somebody that can empathize all day long as opposed to sympathize all day long. Yes, I want people to sympathize and empathize, but at the end of the day, would you rather have somebody put their arm around you and go, I'm so sorry, or would you rather have somebody who's been through what you've been through, hurt the way you hurt, cried the way you cried, and come over and said, I know what you're feeling. See, that's empathy. And see, we have a great high priest who has been tempted in every way. You go, what do you mean he's been tempted? Read Luke 4. Read Matthew 4. He was tempted with his deity. He was tempted to do miracles he shouldn't. He was tempted to go against the word of God. He was tempted in every way all of us have ever been tempted, and he can empathize with that temptation. But what's more important is this. He didn't give in to the temptation. And I believe that all of us end up foregoing our identity, foregoing our sin, foregoing our righteousness, because it's not because we sin, it's because we stop and we don't even go to the great high priest. We don't even go to him to ask him for the strength so we do not commit the sin. We don't even engage in that battle. We just go, I'm tempted, let's do it. I'm tempted, I don't want, I don't want, I don't want, I don't want, let's do it. Come on now. That's how I sin. That's exactly how I sin. I don't even stop and think that I have a great high priest who totally has learned to overcome this. He knows what I'm feeling. He knows what I'm thinking. He knows my desire to do wrong, and he knows my desire to do right. But instead of saying, Jesus, this is how I feel. Have mercy on me. I should have no shame because it says go boldly to him. God, help me overcome this. I go, I shouldn't, God. I shouldn't, God. I shouldn't. Ah! Is any of that your spiritual battle, or is that just Ben's? I do a lot of, ah, in my, <laughs> in my spiritual battles. You know, I think that a lot of us forget we have a great high priest that we can go to. I don't know about you, but it makes me feel quite comfortable that Jesus understands what it's like to be tempted, and he understands how to overcome temptation in the process. Because every time I've ever gone, ah, to the other side, I have never gotten what I was searching for. Have you? We always end up back on our knees, sorry, praying, repenting. Not living the life of victory in Christ Jesus he wants us to have because we don't engage in the battle. We just give ourselves over before the first shot's ever fired. And yet we have this great high priest we could give in to or we can give ourselves over to, who understands the nature of that temptation, who understands the hurt in that temptation, and we need to give ourselves over to him before we ever give, give ourselves over to that. That's part of the power of the priesthood. So then, you're a chosen people, you're a royal priesthood, I'm going to skip holy nation, and this is the thing. Now, so this is what you are. Chosen priesthood, Royal nation, called people. Now, what is it a priest does? Well, they declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness. Hey, I got an idea. I'm going to count to three. One, two, three. And here's what you're going to do. You're going to shout a praise. That's what you're going to do. I'm going to count to three. Because if you're a priest, what are we supposed to do? That we may what? Declare. Not whisper. I'll do it in a prayer circle. 
I'll text Jason. I'll tell my wife later. No, we're to declare. We are to declare. So I'm going to count to three. And I want you to, I know, people are like, come on, Ben. Uh-uh, we're priests. We declare. Amen? Amen? We declare. So if that's our job, then I want you on the count of three to declare the praise of him who called you out of darkness. Declare a praise. One, two, three. All right, good. I have no idea what that was. It's a ayahoya. Okay? That's great. That is fantastic. I love that people have praises to declare. And if you don't have a praise to declare, that's okay. We're going to get to that in a moment. Doesn't mean you aren't part of the priesthood of believers. Just means maybe we haven't taken a stock of our lives. Maybe you're in a heavy, uh, you know, a heavy season of life right now, and it's hard to find those praises. I've been there too, okay? Or maybe you do like some people, like, okay, I know the Jesus thing is, I woke up this morning and I know his mercies are new every day. But you don't believe it. You're like, I'm going to go home, my house is going to be a mess, the kids have already tore this up, toilets plugged, no food, Kristen didn't go shop. No, she did. Okay. But that's what goes on in our heads. Now, if you don't have some, let me remind you why we're, we're we called to gather together, why, why, we, why we gather together. And we gather together as saints so that we may spur one another on in good deeds. So I want to read something to you that was given to me last week, uh, right when I was done says, Dear Celebrate Recovery staff and associates. So that's a ministry that Jim Warner, Brandon Lambright, and Jerry Hicks lead. Jim Warner oversees it. Brandon Lambright sees the Wednesday night. And Jerry Hicks runs the program on Saturdays in jail with other people. My name is, I don't know if I should give the name. And I am writing you to thank you for providing your program and services to LaGrange County Jail. Because of your program and my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, I was able to overcome the devastating effects and emotional trauma of my best friend's suicide. That I had the misfortune of being the one to discover it. The effects of that discovery traumatized me and drove me into a downward spiral of drugs, drug addiction, and my current trouble with the authorities which caused me to lose my everything, my job, my house, my freedom. That drove me even deeper into a deep, dark depression. That was heading me on a course with the same ending as my best friend. But after my arrest, I turned to Christ for comfort and peace, and he led me to you, Celebrate Recovery. And with your help, I have been able to face my problems and my fears, to talk about them openly with others in similar problems, and to discover a new life for me, not my old life that was torn into pieces, but a whole new life. As a new man with a new purpose and a new future, where only before I could see death and darkness, now I see light, joy, and peace like never before. So I have taken pen into hand, and thank you personally for this new beginning uh, start on life. I thank each and every one of you for making this possible. I thank you from the bottom of my heart, and I pray to God for all of you, for all that you have done for me and for all the lucky souls that have been helped in their time of need in their life's new journey. I feel so lucky and blessed that you have entered my life when you did. Thank you, for, thank you again and again. God bless, and please continue in your life-saving quest to help all of us that are in the need of your most excellent services. Thank you, and God bless. <laughs> Jim Warner, where are you at? I saw you in here earlier. Stand up. Does Jim look like a priest? No. Brandon Lambright, stand up. Do you look like a priest? No. no. <laughs> You're catching on. You're getting ahead. Is Jerry in here? Jerry, you know, it's NASCAR season. He's being a priest over there, okay? <laughs> now, if you looked at them and we started at the beginning with the idea of a priest, we'd never go, well, these people are priests. But all these people have accepted this responsibility to go out and declare God's praises. Because when Jerry got that letter, Jerry ran right up to me after church on Sunday and was like, you have to see this letter. And I'm here to share you that letter to declare the praises of his glory. To declare the praises of his glory. Because that's who our God is. Our God does bring new hope, new life, new joy, 
New purpose, new meaning, new vision. That's who we are, and those are the praises he gives us. I'll give you another one. So last week, we had a couple baptisms. And after, or no, before service, Kevin came up and told me, you put it on Facebook, so I'm going at it, all right? Like, you told me that your father had, like, heart attack or congestive heart failure. failure. Okay, well, he he looked bad, okay? So, but your beautiful daughter here was getting baptized, Now, I don't know about any of you, but if I was a parent or a grandparent and my child was baptized, whether I was a believer or not, I'd want to be at that baptism, wouldn't you? And if I knew that I chose to reject God and not take care of my health and not do those things and ended up missing my granddaughter's baptism, I wouldn't feel too good about myself. Matter of fact, I'd probably start taking some condemnation. But Kevin asks, so I shall go because Kevin jumped in and Chandra jumped in head feet and first and all of it and they've gone and I'm like yeah I'll go for you so we go down we sit and I'm in Kenderville hospital and I'm meeting a guy I've never met before and we tried to talk for a minute but everybody was you got a loud family dude so like everybody was super loud and finally I'm like can everybody leave and so everybody left and I, I just I asked him I said will you tell me how you feel about God and all of his jokes all of his sarcasm all of his ha 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 And the real person came out. And tears come out of a broken man. I mean, he's he's on this huge ox can mash. He can't hear him. His legs are, he can't walk. and, And worst of all, he knows he's not taking care of himself. And he can't be a part of such a special day in his granddaughter's life. Now that, to me, if we lived in a hopeless world, would seem like a pretty sour way to be, huh? But I listened to him. I shared the gospel with him. He gave his life to Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. So there's a declare the praise of his glory. So then, ever trying to make all of you feel uncomfortable, I called the family in and I had told him, I was like, today's a bad day. You want to make you know, a bad day into a good day? You want to see how God makes all things new? You want to see how today's mercies are new? He's like, yeah. I'm like, you want to get baptized? He's like, yeah, let's do it. I'm like, awesome. Well, I didn't tell him was granddaughter was going to baptize him. So they all come back in and I got his cup of water. I hope it was sterile. And I gave it to her. I was like, you're going to do the baptizing. Now you feel awkward, right? But remember, you're a priest. (laughs) You're a priest. And you know what she didn't do? She didn't go, no, I can't do that. She didn't go, no, he's my grandpa. She went right over, put water on his head early the first time, premature. She was nervous. Gonna drown him. Yeah, going to drown him. <laughs> but we let him through it. We baptized him in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And I don't know about you, but that fires me up. That fires me up to see that those are the praises of what God is doing. You don't have to be a drug addict. You don't have to be, you know, a, a perfect person. All you have to be is a normal person that's been saved by grace to be faithful and obedient to be who God called you to be. And that is a priest of saints. That's who we're called to be. Our job is to declare his praises. Our job is to be moved that he called us by name. Our job is to be a royal priesthood, to not fall into sin. Our job is to declare those praises. And if you're tracking with me right now and you're like, Ben, I don't feel like that about my name. I don't, I give in over to sin and I don't even quite frankly want to go over to Jesus. And you know what? As a matter of fact, I have no praises to declare because I don't even know what to say about that. Then I would say this to you. Either one, Jesus Christ has never come into your life. Or two, there's another option. You have just foregone this identity. And what has happened is, is remember when I talked about mercy? Remember I said we'll come back to that? What does it say at the very end? It says, once you were not a people, but now you are a people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you what? Have received mercy. Well, this is the whole thing. That end is what charges up the beginning. Okay? It's because of the mercy of God that makes me want to do things. I'm not just inspired by the love of God or the grace of God. i got to be honest with you. I'm inspired by the mercy of God. The idea that I deserved hell and didn't get it anyway inspires me. 
It moves me. And you're like, ooh, my God's not to be feared. You're probably at a place where they're going, peace, 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 peace. Oh, we have a holy God. We have a holy God. Yes, he's loving. Yes, he's merciful. Yes, he wants all people to be saved. But yes, he also finds sin utterly offensive. And the easiest way to draw back and not realize our full role as the priesthood of the saints, I believe, is because we forget his mercy. We get so caught up in all the good things. I coached Little League. I, my kid made honor roll. I smelled better today. You know what I mean? Like whatever you come up with. And I want you to hear me now. As the band comes up, I want you to hear me right now. Because if you're in that place, you may not even know really what to do. You're like, I can say I'm sorry to God, but it doesn't really mean I'm sorry because I'm that hurt. As many of you know, I am um, still a hugger in training. Sometimes I just don't know when. Jason's given me some great coaching sessions, bro. Well, one of the things I've been doing recently is I have found that a hug will cover a multitude of sins or cause a problem. <laughs> Yesterday, we were going to my kids, uh, to Corbin's basketball game, and we walked into a gym full of people. And as we're walking in, and I mean, there's just people everywhere. You're doing that, like, cattle shoot thing. And somebody just grabs my coat and pulls it, bad arm, pulls my arm. And I turn around, and we lock eyes, and I'm like, don't know this person. So you know what I've been doing recently if I don't know you? I just hug you. <laughs> and I'm like, ha! And it was about that point I could feel fingers in my chest. And she, I let go and she was like, okay. <laughs> Didn't know we were huggers. I'm like, no, I'm really not a hugger. I'm just practicing. <laughs> I still don't know the appropriate time to hug. Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. But I went at it anyway. And what's to say I was wrong? What's the worst thing that ha happened? I hugged a 70-year-old woman, right? I think most of us are simply too afraid to accept the idea that God called us to be a royal priesthood. God caused us, saved us, redeemed us to be the, declare the praises of His glory. And if we just stop for one minute, meditated on the mercy that he showed us by not giving us sin and death, but by giving us godly people in our life, by giving us the gospel, by giving us his spirit, and by all of those things, we can't help but be multiplied into the future. And if you don't know where to start, the best thing I can tell you is this. We have a great high priest who could what? Empathize. And we had a great high priest who did not want to go to the cross. Remember that part? Remember that part? On the night he was crucified, before he went in, he went into Gethsemane and he fell down. And the ultimate temptation was to do what? Not the Lord's will, but his will. But what did he say? But not my will, but your will. I ask in the name of Jesus today that God would give you the strength, that God would give you the faith, that God would give you the courage to call upon him now and declare not just the praises of his glory, but to call yourself the priesthood of saints. And if you stop for one minute, and I'll ask you to stand up right now, and you stop in just silence before the band takes off and think, Think for one moment about when he saved you, about when he came into your life, and that joy that you had where you were running, 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 doing everything you could to keep up with him because you were in love with him. If you've fallen so far away from that, today is the day where you can turn around and say, I'm sorry. And when you declare the praise, when you declare your identity as the priesthood of saints, then you go about declaring more and more good because that's who our God is. So today... Just close your eyes for a minute. And I want you to think, where are you? 
Are you a priest that's doing all you can? Are you declaring? Are you moving? Are you a priest who's, who's fallen back because you've forgotten God's mercy? Or were you, did you, you never have Christ in you? Has that never been a part of your life? If so, that can be fixed right now. That can be fixed by coming forward and talking with one of the pastors so you can accept Christ into your life and join the priesthood of believers. But for those of us today who are a part of the priesthood of believers, our job is to declare His glory. And so, before they take off, I want you to think of one praise to declare. And we're going to sing this song, Oh, Praise the Name. And as you're praising the name, I want you to think about that one thing where you can declare God's glory in.